A friend of mine was expanding his business and wanted a second crew. He estimated I'd make up to 60000 that season taking pictures on the midway. Seemed like a quick and easy path to a boatload of cash for going off-grid. Two others joined me, 19-year-old Victoria and 27-year-old Steve. She'd face paint, he'd do airbrush tattoos, while I ran a photo button booth. They had no driver's licenses, and I had zero towing experience. Our rig was a full-sized, extended cargo van with a 35-foot trailer. Two days later, after long winding mountain passes, we made camp in Vancouver near Hastings Street in an industrial area. Everywhere you looked, covered with homeless people living in run-down motorhomes, vans, and tents. Tarps covered every RV roof, cardboard in all the windows, empty propane tanks scattered about, and garbage everywhere. A couple camped next to us, living in what appeared to be a hoarder's dream house on wheels, packed right to the windows stopped by. After a little small talk, I asked how long we might be able to stay before the cops ran us out. Through a toothless smile, he said, Anybody could stay here without issue. We've been here for months. Nobody cares. A few days later, when we moved to set up our booths in a Coquitlam Mall parking lot, security booted us out immediately. The entire carnival, in fact, had to pack up and sleep elsewhere. No overnight parking was strictly enforced citywide. A typical show involved driving a relaxing few days to our destination, setting up our booths, and working the weekend at our own pace. Sometimes our booths got put right next to the loudest ride on the grounds, the hurricane. It had eight cars fixed to a central mast and is pneumatic and hydraulically driven. As it comes to full speed, centrifugal force slides you outwards and then each car surges up and down. The forces are overwhelming to the point you can't raise your arms. And once immobilized, there's a burst of speed and a loud hiss of air stabbing into your eardrums like nails. Simultaneously excited by the enormous speed, you feel an impending catastrophe could take your life on every turn. It's tempting to try and capture this excitement, like one rider attempted, but knocked his teeth out instead. On another occasion, a rider puked. It was going so fast, every person behind him caught some, and a bunch more people then added to the misted sickness. And of course, it all came down, all over the operator and everyone watching. It wasn't unusual for us to have to move partway through a show because of some lot owner or resident's complaint. One time we moved to Home Depot. The back lot looked largely unused, potholes everywhere, and customers never parked there. It was nice and quiet, trees nearby, and a view of the pine-covered mountains. Frogs and coyotes put me to sleep every night, but I guess our secluded camping spot was too quiet. Cut chain links lay on the ground where our generator used to be. Once April arrived, the rains came. We were rained out most days, making no money. When the rain stopped, it was so windy at the carnival, a vendor's tent lifted up and blew away. None of the rides dared to start up. The carnival owners were deciding if they should risk opening, while their mini donut booth alone could be making $5,000 per day. My companion's tents were jumping up to six inches on their tethers and violently slamming back down. The lot owners hadn't allowed us to stake down, and our multiple five-gallon water weights weren't adequate. Compounding this problem, our tents were attached to each other, acting like a mega sail. We were standing inside a soon-to-be giant kite in 70 km per hour winds. Speeds like that, the tents would become mangled metal missiles. Anyone caught in their path would likely be crippled or potentially killed by a 150-pound tumbleweed. We took our tents down and packed up. The carnival didn't open that day. Things did improve with each successive show after that. Things got a lot more scenic and downright exciting, like boarding the ferry to Nanaimo. Crew decks and safety vests wearing fume protective masks directed our rig to our parking lane on board, which was over 15 semis long. We were located at deck two, just below the water line, completely enclosed behind the bulkhead. No doors, no windows, just a heavy sliding metal door to the surface. That door would automatically slide open or closed, regardless of any obstacle. At landfall, our route took us north through the island's interior, traveling a never-ending corridor of trees with wolves and mountain lions appearing like ghosts in the darkness. It's beautiful, nothing but scenic coastal areas, rocky islands, swimming areas, and plenty of interesting hikes.
It was getting on to be the end of April, and we'd all experienced a horrible letdown. Carnival life wasn't the huge cash boon we'd hoped for. Steve went on long walks, which didn't involve any walking. Victoria popped Percocet-like vitamins and took wine into movie theaters. Not only stressed about our finances, we struggled to find camping spots. So before we moved on to Duncan, I tried making a reservation with an RV park. A woman answered the phone. Hey there, do you have a spot for the week? I asked. Yes, a couple of spaces. How many adults and children? Any pets? Perfect, it's just three adults. There's no room, she said, click. I called again to get an explanation. Hello, she answered. It's me again. Don't hang up. I'm just curious why we can't stay there. There was a pause. She took a long breath. We used to get non-family types coming through. Real sketchy people, doing drugs and making trouble. Homeless transients were wrecking businesses, and other tenants didn't want to stay. Now we only let married couples or families stay here. A tarp city once stretched several city blocks along the city banks until the mayor had them evicted. A spring cleaning of sorts before tourist season. All that remains now around the silent campfires are the leftovers. Blankets, clothes, and sleeping bags litter the ground from a thrown away people. We stayed in an RV camp more accommodating to colorful people. Most of the residents were full-time. There were planters and gaudy yard decorations, trailers falling apart. One place even had a boat poking out of the shell of a trailer. That was Duncan, not the tourist magazine cover showcasing people happily sipping wine around the table of an idyllic vineyard surrounded by vast vegetable gardens in a never-ending growing season. You could literally spend all day here, and this is only just uh, a third of the park in this spot. There's a little lake that they stocked with trout when they filled in the quarry with water. But all good things had to come to an end. Victoria caught the attention of a carny that wore a heavy gold chain around his neck with a wispy, pervy mustache. Later on, she tried to rid herself of him after he'd trashed his own bunk, punching holes in the walls and screaming for everyone to go F themselves. Turns out he had served time for a few years. Still, even after he was fired, he followed us to multiple shows. Eventually, he did stop. I guess he just ran out of money or her hiding away finally convinced him she'd gone home. Spring came to a close and we found ourselves at Grand Prairie. My companions complained the whole trip for not staying with the other workers, so we set up camp among them. Something I'd avoided the whole trip. Some carnies drank booze from water bottles during setup and frequently fought each other. My companions even told me of cocaine parties at hotel rooms with escorts. Within one day of carny life, Victoria stopped showering sleeping or eating. She drank and did drugs for four days straight, partying every night and fell asleep painting children's faces. Then she'd wander off from her booth and crash for several hours. At multiple times she hallucinated, heard things, had an irregular heartbeat, and whenever she spoke to me, twitched, and rapidly talked vacantly in my general direction. I learned later she had a previous drug issue years earlier, and the carny influence had brought it out. As if Victoria's state wasn't enough stress for me. Steve's money belt got stolen. The carnival boss's wife swore up a storm in his face when he reported it and screamed in public for us to not come to the Edmonton show. They threatened to give up our spot to a long waiting list of other vendors. We ended up at Edmonton anyway, and my first day made $35. Our second day, it poured rain. We weren't the only ones suffering. No one on the midway was doing well. Up until that point, I'd accepted the low-income situation as a paid vacation. But after adding up all the money I'd made since March and comparing it to full-time work, it came to $2.50 per hour. And when summer finally ramped up, things still hadn't improved. Carney lifers began quitting at every show. So I pulled the plug. Our final three shows on the way home were one last grab for cash, and Fort McMurray was first in the line. A big oil town where money had been tossed around like water. Only for us, it wasn't. NDP sanctions and regulations triggered thousands of layoffs. 
Oil patch workers with fat wads used to blow hundreds of dollars at the carnival. Now Steve was asking me how much a bus ticket home was. Show two at Wainwright brought lightning, thunder, heavy rain, and winds up to 80 kilometers per hour. Our trailer rocked violently throughout the night. Rain pounded against the siding like buckets of gravel, deafening us. I feared at any moment to be struck by lightning, smashed by a blown apart shopping cart shelter, or see a tornado forming overhead. My mind raced with survival options, and settled on simply ramming the van through the front doors of Walmart and taking shelter in the bathroom. <laughs> After our night of terror, the carnival owner delayed setup, fearing a tornado was an imminent threat. My crew and I left to evade this coming destruction, with our ears locked on the radio for warnings, but there were none. Locals gave me strange looks when I asked about a tornado. After an hour of staying within a hundred feet of our van, and no evidence of impending death, we went back to work. Carnies were busily constructing rides, setting up booths, and hanging stuffies. It had all been a drug-fueled, paranoid delusion in the owner's mind. The sun was out, but the money didn't come. We were shocked to discover one carnival booth made $2,000 on a slow, rainy day. Victoria maybe made 300 per week since we hit Alberta. She quit, took a job with the carnival, and moved out of our trailer that day. And our final show, the Pinocchio Stampede, was about to be par for the course. Riders come from as far away as Texas to compete. It's the biggest rodeo around, only second to the Calgary Stampede. If money was to be made, that should have been it. I made ten bucks. And to ensure there was no hope left, on the ninth day there was a legitimate tornado warning. The skies darkened, rapidly filling with dark menacing clouds. The wind picked up, and then it dumped an unholy amount of rain. Our payday ran to their homes while we huddled in despair under our tents. I'd burned $300 on raffle tickets the day before, which seemed like a good idea at the time. I lost $300. The lack of green finally hit everyone. A ride operator chased a carny around with a metal pipe for using his spray bottle to clean another ride. This same guy had also had his girlfriend leave him for beating her with a flashlight. He was fired. The morning after our final day, Steve and I went to pack up our booths. On the way we chatted about work, reflecting on the lack of it, and what we might do back home. As we passed a parked cargo van, we noticed the dude in the back, drinking coffee. At that point in our journey, I had come to expect anything. How crazy would it be if he came after us? Within moments of that thought, I heard a commotion and turned to see the guy stumble out. <sighs> Boy, that would be so crazy if he ran after us. I turned again to the sound of running. He cut us off and yelled, Who's not working now? Blankety, blankety, blank. Who's not working now? Over and over in our faces, all I could think was, it's too early for this. Just go away. If there was ever a time I was about to be stabbed, now was it. Six feet and 230 pounds of drugged out, crazy anger was barking in my face. His outburst made no sense, and I simply couldn't be bothered. I just started walking away. Yep, that was the plan. Just walk away. He followed us, screaming for a whole block. I confused him, sending Steve across the street while I doubled back. There was lots of people crossing the street, so I wasn't worried about Steve as I headed to move our trailer, which was painfully near Psycho's van. Thankfully, nothing else schizophrenic happened. Out there working the carnival, traveling from town to town, countless people passed before me crowding around booths and rides. Individuals gave way to a generic, faceless representation of the human race. A dumb mass seeking overpriced products and short-term thrills. It really drove home the insignificance of my life, of anybody's. It was a shadow of how millions live in the real world, standing in lines, consuming, seeking thrills, luxury items, eating fast food, and turning into mindless entertainment binging zombies. Nothing but glorified lemmings in a never-ending line of consuming. All the while, tweeting smugly on smartphones about nothing. Amounting to nothing. <laughs>